This is Jim Semivan, and you are listening to That UFO Podcast. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to That UFO Podcast. My name is Andy, and joining me for a preview on the upcoming hearings, if you're listening to this before the 13th of November 2024, they'll certainly be upcoming. I've got Dan. Welcome back, Dan. Hey, hey. Yeah, we've got the, the hearings upcoming, and... Uh... It's on everyone's minds. What what's going to happen? Who's going to show up? Is is this disclosure? No spoiler alert. Probably no. <laughs> just not. that's it. End show. Yeah, <laughs> that's not to say it couldn't be very very interesting, and that's the whole point of doing this. Um, yep. What we're, what we're going to look at is you know kind of what's happening, when it's happening, what some of the expected discussion points will be within it. Um, some swings for the fences. You know what some of the stuff we would really like to see happen, but probably won't. Some of the stuff maybe we don't want to see happen at it. Um, and then I've got some, I mentioned on the breakdown, Dan, people had sent in some lists of who they would like to see and why, and then some listener questions on the hearings as well. If anything happens, folks, before the hearings, I've not decided exactly when this will go out, but obviously well before, um, there'll be an update on the back of that. Dan may or may not be available for that, depending on his fiance being in the country and being around. Um, but depending on what it is, I've got some guests lined up before then that I would talk to about it. But I'm not expecting... We'll get to that, actually, because that's probably a discussion sure. point within that as to why I don't think there'll be too much comes out before then. But Dan, 13th of November, 2024, uh, we have essentially a UFO hearing happening with Congress. What's the official title of what's happening, though? You had it just before. Oh, there was a little blip in audio there. I didn't catch the end, but I'll just crack them anyway. Uh, yeah, so the the oversights, uh, the Subcommittee on Cybersecurity, IT, and Government Innovation are holding a UFO or UAP hearing. It's going to be chaired by uh, Nancy Mace, Representative Nancy Mace, uh, who seems like a bit of a firecracker when it came up that the hearings might not be held, she uh, she gave the statement, come hell or high water, I'm holding a hearing. So yeah. she's not messing around here. Um, and then we've also got uh, Gerald Connolly, uh, who is a ranking member. And then we've got a few a few different faces that will pop up. I'll just list them all. Uh, some people recognize, some people won't. Uh, on the Republican side in the committee, we've got William Timmons, Tim Burchett, Marjorie Taylor Green, Anna Paulina Luna, Nick Langworthy, Eric Burleson. And then on the Democratic side, we've got Ro Khanna, Stephen Lynch, uh, Kwesi Mafumi, I'm going to say. I might have just butchered that name. I apologize. Sounds like you have. I can't even see it. Um, it, like, yeah. <laughs> it it's spelled K-W-E-I-S-I, -E and then the surname is M-F-U-M-E. Um, I did my mm. best, but I apologize. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, then we've got Jared Moskowitz and Anna Presley. Similar to the last hearing, we'll probably see some people that aren't kind of on the committee showing up to, to ask questions because they're just interested in this. Uh, but that is looking like a lineup that we'll have to who, who will be asking questions. As to who's going to be testifying, all we know so far is that Tim Gallaudet, um, who his title it eludes me, but he he's kind of basically high up in the Navy in terms of uh, former you know, Admiral Chips. Former rear yeah. admiral, there you go. Um, and yeah, he, he's made such statements in the past, like, I'm totally convinced that we are experiencing a non-human higher intelligence because I know people who were in the legacy programs that oversaw both the crash retrieval and the analysis of UAP data. He was also in the fleet uh, and able to receive the email that had the gimbal video that we all know attached, which is the one uh, of the UFO kind of turning in the air. Um, the Ryan Grave Squadron encountered uh, he goes on, if you've seen Beyond, the, the great new series on MGM+, Plus, he, he features in there and he shares this story. Uh, he received that email and then no one kind of followed up with it. No one was talking about it at brief ends and then the email disappeared from the whole system. So he, he'll he be testifying there. As to who else, um, Luis Elizondo, uh, the guy who ran ATIP, has imminent the book out. Uh, has hinted on various different podcasts now that he might be called to testify. So we'll see if that comes comes out. But um, the last year and had three people, uh, yep. David Fravor, Ryan Graves, David Grush. So I think it's fair bet to expect three people here as well. So there's a, a big question mark on who else is going to show up. And uh, I think 
almost I forget they weren't really a part of the hearing but I always in my head have Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp were part of that hearing but they were sat directly behind them next to David yes. Grush's lawyer Charles McCullough the third so it's just like they're in my head I'm like well they were there as well but they were actually just there attending um, as many members of the UFO community were I believe if you were going along you have to be there incredibly early to guarantee your self-entry um, like you're probably looking at an effort of at least going the night before and yeah. camping outside to make sure you get in because uh, they only let so many folks in um, but they will be what? televised so you will be able to watch it on it's usually on C-SPAN but they'll also be on YouTube and stuff like that so if you can't the get revolution, in, you know, you can the revolution just... will be televised as <laughs> a famous somebody Video once said the radio stuff. <laughs> yes it did um, so Run through there, Dan. Where's the best place to start? So we've got this hearing happening. Essentially, we're going to have members of Congress, and perhaps, I don't know if this is even possible, other folks in and out of Congress asking questions to... Is it definitely three... Is it, is it always three witnesses, or is it just Not three? Not always. Somebody, you, it, it could, could be, be four. ten, right? Uh, could be, yeah, yeah, it could be four, it could but be five. You'd imagine like we'll it. have at least three witnesses, similar to last time, and they will be under oath... Let me talk about this under oath thing, okay? There seems to be this idea that because someone is under oath, well, they, they can't lie. They can. And I'm sure people have lied under oath. And when you're talking about a subject as divisive or as with a classification so secret that you're going, what, top, top, top secret, you know, it's up there with the A-bomb, you know, past nuclear technologies and whatnot, why wouldn't? high-ranking members of the government lie under oath about this kind of stuff they they are actually required so if you're part of an unclassified special access program you're required as being part of that program to deny its existence it doesn't matter who's asking that's what you have to do so if someone was to take the oath and be asked does this program exist and they've been sworn into that program they would say no <laughs> and if they didn't say no that would be against the government's interest so yeah. when we we often touch on this, when, when we say the government, it doesn't mean that everyone's in agreement. When we say someone has no. top secret access, it doesn't mean that they have access to everything. It just means yeah. that you're able to be kind of shown certain things or, or brought into certain rooms uh, if you're deemed worthy of, of kind of seeing it. Um, and, then, and then comes the issue of NDAs as well, that people sign when they sign on to these things. Um, Jim Lekatsky and Colin Callagher of uh, ORSAP. Uh, if people have read Skinwalker at the Pentagon and stuff like that, you'll know those names. They, they worked at Skinwalker and on kind of the precursor to, to ATIP. They've refused to testify because they, they said um, that basically it goes against the NDAs that they signed. Mm -hmm. And because they were working with an outside contractor, the kind of government rules don't apply. So they have to, you, you know, it's, it's proprietary information they would be sharing. So yep. they just said, eh, we'd prefer not to because we feel like we're, we're breaking that oath and we're breaking that uh, trust that we were given. So even though, you know, it's, it's been said that, well, if something illegal is committed, then the NDA doesn't apply. If you've signed that NDA, then you will expect repercussions that were outlined in the NDA. And without reading it, we, we don't know what they, those are, but they, they could be very heavy. Yeah, it seems it's so black and white for people to think. And and no offense if you're mega patriotic in the States, the UK, wherever you're 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 from, but the the idea that because someone's in the military or government and they're serving their country and they've taken an oath or whatever, doesn't mean there aren't other reasons they may or may not tell the truth about something. And again, when we're talking about something as important or as secret as the UFO topic the disclosure of non-human intelligence visiting, being here, as having the tech. It just seems so obvious that people are going to lie for different reasons as well. And like you say, it could even be people being threatened in the background, and it could be their families are threatened by shadowy figures and whatnot. And that doesn't even just have to be, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll murder your family as, as drastic as that. That could just be, you know, oh, your your wife. So here's a, here's a way of using it. Much less important. But I listen to a football podcast. People genuinely know that I support, right? Things aren't going particularly well for us at the minute. But listening to one of those podcasts, they talked about um, our previous owner, a couple of owners ago, David Murray. So he saw oversaw a very successful period in Rangers history. He basically had some 
now podcasters who were members of a fans group um, and he would invite them into his office to speak to them because they had such a prom prominent voice amongst the fans. They would sometimes go into local radio stations and whatnot and he heard some of their interviews they were doing about how he was running the club at the time, invited them into his office and basically threatened them without threatening them. One was to remove their season ticket from them to say you're not going to be, and there is a point to this folks, you know, so you're going to lose your seat Dan at, at Ibrooks. Okay, that's fine. I'll go and sit somewhere else. You won't know I'm there. And then they were like, okay, Dan, your partner, you know, Florence, she works at the flower shop on John Street, doesn't she? And it was things like that were mentioned. So sure. I know the owner of that company, not even the business. I know the owner of that company where your partner's got a burgeoning career. I can make that career end very quickly. Things like that. So imagine taking yep. that up to level where people are covering secrets like the UFO topic. It just takes, you can have whole families and your friends and mortgages defaulting and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, saving pensions gone. Saving gets stolen or defrauded. And how, and it's easy for people to sit and say, yeah, come out, it's for the good of mankind. You tell us all the secrets you know. But if that's hanging over you in the background, it just must be so difficult to do that. So I can completely see why, not even just for, for what Colm and, and Jim have said. Um, why folks would be so resident resident to come forward and have those conversations um so fair play to yeah. anyone who is but i understand why certain folks at least at the minute won't and i think uh, james lakatsky or colm kelleher one of the two on that podcast mentioned the whistleblower protections only do so much much yeah. like witness protection programs oh we're going to keep you safe well depending on what's happened and who you're being kept safe from people can find out where you are people can yep. find out your new names we've all seen the simpsons folks so yeah <laughs> um i think it's it's not black and white it's so many shades of gray um within that we we often hear as well that if whistleblowers come forward just being in the public eye you know that this happened with bob lazar i think it was by coming out with your story you're kind of protected because the public's eyes are on you in so many ways that doesn't matter you know people uh and for the people on listening to this they won't see me do it i'm doing kind of air quotes people fall out of windows all the time and it, it's easy enough to make something look or they shoot themselves you know, in the back of the head twice twice yeah. yeah yeah i think one of the russian assassinations in the uk was like the guy stabbed himself 30 times with a knife and was found yeah. on the kitchen floor so things like that and or almost you know we, we laugh about you know the 30 times with an iphone twice in the back of the head that almost serves as like a warning signal, right? Like you can't confirm that this happened, but to anyone else coming out, you know, you know for sure that this is this is happened as a result of them coming forward. Um, I know it happened with uh, there was some suspicion around a couple of Boeing whistleblowers who who died. Um, yeah. I haven't seen any follow up on that, but it you know it, it's not outside of the realm of possibility and. And when it's your loved ones and it's your life on the line, it's it's very different from sitting behind a keyboard on a computer saying, just tell us. No offense to everyone. And bear in mind, we are sitting behind keyboards and computers talking to you yeah. saying you want them just to tell us. Um, it would be great, <laughs> wouldn't it? Um, so, Dan, let's take it back a step because often people will say they might just be listening to this for the first time or listening to UFO podcasts in general with a new or renewed interest in the topic and be hearing names and all that kind of stuff. So, keeping it simple, this hearing is a follow-up to a hearing we had last year with David Grush, Dave Fravor, Ryan Graves. What is the purpose of these hearings and let's take it back to the first one because we've had a hearing on ufos in july 2023 with grush fravor graves um we don't have disclosure quote unquote mm -hmm. so what's the we, we also the we also had you know? one with uh, the guys Ray that run sog very moultrie yeah. yeah um aim sog again for people that don't follow this and are new um the uaptf the UAP task force, that name changed at some point. Um, I'm not even going to try and remember what the AIMSOG one <laughs> meant, uh, but then that's now changed to Arrow. So the government keeps rebranding like like New Coke, basically. Yeah. Um, so those guys that ran that were, were grilled over the coals by, by Congress at one point. And then the hearing with David Fravor and you know the other pilots followed that. And now this one's following that. So, let's, so the first one didn't really go out 
anywhere. We didn't get a lot from it. There was a lot of, oh, I don't really know about that, was a lot of the answers to those questions from Bray and Moultrie. Yeah. Uh, we we assumed, I think, Dan, at the time, as most folk did, they kind of played dumb with that and sure. prob probably lied or at least told the truth as much as they knew it, but knew it wasn't the full truth. Something like that, okay? We then had the, the hearings last year with uh, Grush and Co., where the big statements from it, I think, to be fair, not to downplay it, Fravor and Graves being former pilots, what they spoke about was of great interest to the public and also the folks from Congress who were hearing a lot of this maybe for the first time and face-to-face. -face. We knew the Fravor and Graves stories really well. If you were involved in the community, it was stuff we knew. Grush, however, dropped kind of bombshell after bombshell because this guy who we didn't know too much about was coming out. Um, he'd been out with Ross Coulter and the story story there. Um, he, I think at that time, had done the podcast, American Alchemy. I can't remember if that was just before, just after. But he then came out and talked about the US government had indeed... I think Nancy Mace may have been the one that asked the question, I can't remember, about the, the have you recovered pilots or were there pilots with these craft? And he basically said, yes, there were non-human biologics and um, basically we have alien bodies, we have recovered craft, there are programs he has access to. He's spoken to over 40 whistleblowers, interviewed 40 people, and Grush was the big story that really, I've said this so many times, Dan, but for the folks at the back, cracked open the door, I felt, genuinely the first time since I've started doing this, or maybe for me ever in the UFO topic, the first time there was almost like internationally, people just for a second went, what? And the, yeah. the heads came above the parapets. If you think Jurassic Park, when the T-Rex is walking towards the car, you know, in the UFO community, we all know the T-Rex is there, but the rest of the world is the, the girl and the boy in the car, and they're looking at the, the cup of water with Jeff Goldblum, and they can see the drops, and it just seemed to be the first time, I think, the international community saw the drops of water were having some kind of effect. They've not seen the dinosaur yet, but it was like something got their attention just for a moment. Yeah, I think that's a really good way of putting it. When when you mentioned Jurassic Park, then I thought you were going to mention the lawyer on the toilet, but much better example. <laughs> uh, yeah. But yeah, and that that moment, you know, Grush's testimony was responsible, I think, for the UAP hearing ending up on Times 100 Moments of the Year. Yes. And yeah. it really broke out into places that, that we'd not seen before. You know, UFOs went mainstream um, for a solid chunk of time. And and we've been waiting for like the next thing after that, you know, Grush just used an op-ed, uh, which hasn't happened. Um, he's now embroiled in a lawsuit about his kind of medical records being revealed uh, by someone that was trying to kind of disparage his efforts and stuff like that. Um, but I guess that's by the by for what we're talking about. I, I think the purpose of these hearings is to do pretty much exactly what we've said, kind of twofold. One is to get members of Congress involved as you know, that list at the beginning that I read of the people that are going to be present, the representatives, there's a whole bunch of new faces there. Um, I hope they all show up for the heat in hearing. Sorry. Um, I, I'm not sure that, you know, they're required to, uh, the, the chair certainly is. Um, but it would be great to see new people asking questions about this stuff and, and seeing those ripples in the glasses as you so well put to it. To what end though? So you say for these people to get involved for you, what's the, not the end game even, but what is the goal here leading on from this hearing? What's what's the impact going to be that we can say there's what happened off the back of that? I think the the impact, the signs that it would have impact would be more legislation next year, kind of closing some of those loopholes that show that these members of Congress want to have oversight of any kind of ufo program that's going on that they don't know about that they're required to know about by law congress has what's called the gang of eight who are meant to be briefed on even unclassified um and classified uh special access programs so by law there are certain members of congress that should know about any secret ufo programs that are going on i think david grush kind of highlighted the fact that there may be programs, very real programs that they don't have oversight of. And so the law isn't being followed. And Congress kind of exists to, you know, you've got Congress, you've got, oh, sorry, you've got the Senate, you've got the House, those things together are referred to as Congress and interchangeably. They kind of keep each other in check. They kind of have arm wrestles. 
and can keep the president or the executive office in check as a result. It's kind of like a, a three-way relationship, right? And they, that's the whole reason that it's there is to keep each other in check. And it looks like the executive office at some point has approved a program or approved work and said, you, you get to do whatever you want kind of with this stuff in the background. So Congress, upon finding about that, finding out about this, should be understandably annoyed that the Constitution isn't being followed and they don't get oversight. And it comes down to, you know, public spending. Where's the money going? Um, the Pentagon has famously failed so many audits of, and they can't account for where all their money goes, that this could be a very real black hole that, that kind of a lot of the money is going into. Um, these people can't do their jobs if they don't know what's going on. And I'm sure Chris Mellon has kind of spoken to that as well. You know, he, he couldn't advise the security apparatus of the United States of America if he doesn't know that the airspace is being violated by these craft that, that with impunity and that they can't track and that seem to be so advanced. So I think the, the goal of it is to kind of hold any secret program to account to get it under proper oversight. Now, whether the goal of it is to have kind of full open kimono transparency on this or for them to have a you know almost a blue book 2.0 like like arrow is accused of being at the moment mm -hmm. um where they only tell us certain things that's going to kind of i think we'll, we'll see what approach they take going forward but it certainly seems like at the moment that we don't have a need to know everything but at the very least the members of congress that that gang of eight that should know about this stuff are, are clamoring for oversight of it and seeing those ripples made them kind of go huh well it's our job like why why aren't we given oversight of this how how do you get to operate outside of the law and it's the law of the land right like everyone yeah. agrees to abide by the law if people there's some discussion really, point really not care yeah no 100 percent. there's some well put there's some discussion points across here that i won't go into because it's not really relevant to a preview of the hearings and the some of the stuff around that we'll keep for another time maybe for after the hearings especially um i think one of what i would expect the big discussion points in this hearing to be is the talk of the the program that was discussed journalist michael schellenberger broke a few weeks ago and um, we heard of this program called immaculate constellation which is apparently the official name of at least one of the uap ufo recovery programs crash retrieval programs which was to um, recover and study craft of non-human origin that we are crashed downed shot down gifted whatever it may be um by the u.s government so we got the official name it was apparently the report was brought forward by one person um others have corroborated one of the possibilities dan is one of those witnesses could be the person who's brought this story forward um i think this is something that could really get the attention and imagination of the public because one it's got a name which is i think very helpful mm -hmm. you know we're not just talking about you know like when people say don't name your pet like or don't name like a, don't not name your pet I mean, like christmas turkey is a good example of that you know don't name your turkey then you're going to kill it at christmas it's oh like sure that, i get that, i get what yeah yeah when you give something a name even like a uap program it's not just another uap program or ufo program we have the name of one so it becomes a bit more of a tangible thing so i think this is going to get brought up i think this could be the highlight and talking point of the whole the whole event depending on what said who says it and and how it's said. Um, thoughts on Immaculate Constellation then? I keep thinking Immaculate Conception when you say it. Everyone does. Yeah. <laughs> Including you... co-author of um, After Disclosure, Bryce Zabel, on the recent Need to Know podcast. With who, who did he co-author that with? Richard Dolan. Richard Dolan? Okay, yeah, just just yeah. checking. I did another wrote a book together. They did. <laughs> I'm glad they mentioned it. Um, yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. Something tangible. That's what people need, right? Last year, we kind of heard vague like there is a program we have the address we could give you witnesses that have worked firsthand in it and stuff like that but we didn't get much more so you know what what can you say like there's a secret ufo program people have been saying that for like 50 60 100 years now i want to ask you about something there should i come back to ask you or do you want to keep going 
Uh, you can ask me now. Go for it. So, um, last year, you're spot on that one of the big things was David Grush mentioning, I will give the addresses of where basically craft, alien craft are being held, to speak really plainly, um, behind closed doors. So that was July 2023. And it seems as of yet that we've not had Congress breaking down the doors of any facilities, housing, craft of exotic nature. Is that fair? Or if it has happened, we don't know about it. So is that a failing of the last hearing that something incredible was said and allegedly David Grush has given the evidence over? Um, but here we are. Yeah, I totally agree with you. We, we haven't had any follow up on that. It would be wonderful to get follow up on that. Uh, another thing that David Grush mentioned is that there was um, a kind of list of undesirables that were refusing to work with him when when he approached them for information. Uh, that list apparently was given over in a skiff setting, you know, in a, in a classified uh, meeting. We haven't seen anything on that either. I'm, I'm really eager to see those things. But you, you'd think that, you know, if someone went to a base or whatever and there was a UFO that they, they'd speak out about it. But um, I don't know, maybe they went in and the person was behind the door going, here's $10 million, shut the hell up about this. They went no, to a base in Sedona and a mantis being stopped them and went, no, no, there's no UFOs here, sorry. And they just Also, I'm not a mantis, despite my pincers yeah. and my lanky. <laughs> yeah, 100%, got the Joker mask on, just like, yeah, I'm <laughs> definitely not a mantis being, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's an aspect of that, right? And, and the second that Grush would have said that, or the second, the way these programs would be set up, the second they were identified, they things would be moved, things would be shifted, yeah, to kind of hide them again. And we've always said that, you know, even down to with the Immaculate Constellation, that name would be changed now. The second anyone on that program got wind of that name being out, they would change the name just because yeah. that's the sensible thing to do security wise. You think these but, things would change anyway regularly, even the locations? If you were housing a a recovered alien craft, that you would move that every three to six months surely anyway just in case adversarial adver adversaries found out where you were or in case of infiltration foreign spies you know domestic spies private contractors finding stuff out whatever it might be you would just assume surely that i mean i'm not even suggesting we've got underground railways which apparently is a thing though we do have we, we do railway. yeah they're, they're yeah. around you can look them up online you know what that sounds really stupid because i was literally on the underground going to the football at the weekend in glasgow <laughs> i don't mean like subways folks before anyone goes yeah we've not got subways in the uk i mean like proper like subterranean under the ocean bullet train type you know scenarios like yeah that like be bases very cool. connected by tunnels yeah. across the us be, like that kind of thing if we don't yeah however um, I, th I think that kind of stuff anyway. So I don't think they found craft, kept it at Wright Patterson, and it stayed there for you know eighty years. Just yeah, doesn't I, I agree. It, it just wouldn't be secure to do that. No. And if we're sat here as just two guys sat at home, like you know, we we our jobs aren't in security or government or anything like that. If we're thinking that, then they probably move it every week, um, right? <laughs> yeah. Do you not even think that if say we worked for like Lockheed Martin's top secret, where we division where we recruit like navy seals and marines and you know have like a captain america style force of the best of the best of the best for like black ops that we could send those people in to infiltrate uh a site that has alien tech and you would think that the people running that site would even have it that if you broke in you would think you're in the area with the top secret stuff but you're not it's not even yes. there like underneath that along a bit and down somewhere else like it would have to be something like that it's not like there's a a wire fence out saying outside saying keep out but if you do go past that fence and open the door there's a hanger with the ufo on it again i might yeah. be totally wrong and giving people far too much credit here but given what we're talking about for me again that would just make sense yeah, area 51 kind of feels like that to me now like yeah. people go out to area 51 because they're like there are aliens in there they're not in there but the people that actually have anything like that are very happy for you to keep going to Area 51. Yeah. So yeah, I, I agree. And that's that's the wonder about like Bob Lazar's stuff, right? Like, is that what happened? Did did he see the smoke screen and the actual stuff was kind of further on down the line? Who knows? But we can definitely say that off the bat of what Grush said, that you know, names and addresses and stuff, uh the the public has not seen any of that. 
mm-hmm. and immaculate constellation being on people's lips in in the hearing uh would would give something i think the right word you used it tangible you know people will be talking about that and who knows immaculate constellation could become like i just described area 51 they're happy for us to talk about it because we're not saying the real name anymore uh but it certainly gives uh the hounds are sent, so to speak, um, so that Congress can kind of have something that they can go and ask about, you know, because like we've said before, the the Air Force famously won't give you information you don't already have. They'll just go, yes, that happened. They won't give you more stuff. So if, if we could even get a yes, we had Immaculate Constellation running, but we can't confirm or deny its purpose, that would be a hell of a get, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's really intriguing. But I, I really hope that the person that speaks at the hearing about Immaculate Constellation, if it happens, is a first hand witness to that program and work within it. Yeah, and by that, again, in case anyone's listening who's is not too sure, because I think we might get some folks like that, Dan, who are newer to the topic, given the hearings are on the horizon, whatever it might be, or people even listening to this after the hearings are happened and thinking, Oh, I'm going to look into this UFO thing. Well done, you found a reasonably all right podcast i think on it lots of good ones out there though folks check them all out but the idea that you've got a first-hand witness they work there like you're not just you're not friends with a guy who works at mcdonald's you're the guy who works in mcdonald's and it's you're not telling stories about why the mcflurry machine's always broken you're the guy who knows because you know you're working with it on a daily basis and actually the mcflurry machine isn't broken we just don't like using it anymore to mix the mcflurry <laughs> you know everyone thinks that's a story but you want to hear it firsthand and that's what we're yep. talking about folks um but with uap tech not mcflurries don't know why that came <laughs> um but yeah so dan immaculate constellation i think will be something that gets brought up gets talked about um anything for you that you would really like to see broached or discussed i mean we're, we're talking about immaculate constellation and and something within that within schellenbergen's reporting where he said that housed within this database that the program has is 4k videos or multi-spectral kind of readings and and videos of craft that we cannot explain it'd be wonderful to even see a picture of something like that i don't think we will but again it's, it's just to give something tangible you, you know I always think of most people don't read past the headlines on things now, but imagine just a, a headline of Immaculate Constellation, the real UFO program, and then an actual picture of something. It it makes it hard to deny. Yeah, no, no, I can I can I can get away with that. I just made a note for me. Um another thing I'd like to hear discussed when I spoke to Danny Sheehan, he mentioned the CIA had a program called Golden Dome or Golden Domes that he says where the US had an, a, a, the US government, we always say that, don't we, where we're shooting down UAP. I'd love to hear that brought up in an official setting to ask, yeah. or even someone who, who may have knowledge of it, you know, are we shooting these things down? Do we have programs you know about where these things are being shot down, tr- retrieved, wh- whatever else? Um, Tim Gallaudet might be good in that sense as the only witness we know who's definitely testifying he was part of the Navy, to ask if we've shot these things down over water, are you aware of any retrieval operations to go and get these things when they've crashed, how that would have worked? Not that he necessarily, I don't think Tim would have been involved in that directly necessarily. That might be something, but it would be nice to hear that maybe confirmed from him. And he could then, behind closed doors, speak to people in Congress and say, I can point you in the direction of Admiral such and such, you know, whoever it may be, who was involved in that sort of thing, which that that wouldn't go public. We wouldn't hear that. So, yeah, um, another one for me, Dan, would definitely be the, the Golden Dome stuff, just to hear that mentioned. Yeah, I think that's a good shout. And it, it speaks to a bigger issue as well. You know, if the US is shooting these things down, if we're having our first contact with another species, and our first reaction to them is to go, <laughs> we're going to shoot you down. Like, yeah. what the hell? Who decided this? Who gave you the right to decide this? Yeah. And like, what are the implications now that you've essentially set us on a warpath with a more advanced species for the rest of us? You know, the other 8 billion people on the planet. There are massive questions around that. So... I, I immediately think Mars attacks when the, the release <laughs> of the doves and the Martian just yeah. panics and shoots it. <laughs> and then they're just like, ah, just start killing everyone. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, yeah. and they shout, we come in peace as they do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Ah, oh, what a good movie. Um, yeah, hope that doesn't happen. Sorry, um, uh, for yourself then, <laughs> what what else are you looking for to, to hear discussed or brought up? It, it would be nice to, I mean, these hearings have to be a step forward Yeah, from what we had last time. Last time we kind of had, you know, they, they were tangible kind of accusations, but they were still vague accusations. We were still dealing with stories, like I know mm-hmm. someone who, stuff like that. We've since found out that Dave Grush uh, was a first-hand witness to a lot of this stuff, but but didn't speak to it for whatever reason. You know, I imagine NDAs and all that kind of comes into it. But there needs to be a step forward towards towards this more, I'm going to say tangible again, I, I guess, scratch it off your bingo card if you have it, um, towards something that the public and Congress can actually grab onto. Because they, there are only so many times that these hearings are going to be entertained where people tell stories. They cost money, you know, everyone there is being paid. It's their time. Like they could be putting that into other issues that are going on in the world. And especially could, with the election happening and stuff. Go on. Yeah. Could could Grush testify again? And would you be up for Grush being there again? I mean, yes. If if he was I, gonna I go into be... I experienced this firsthand, that, yeah, that would I, be I'm thinking, it would I, it would I, almost make you think differently about the stuff from last year as well yeah. right you go back and yeah. watch her again and be like what was he saying like oh he's actually talking about himself there yeah um i'd i'd be up for grush again um if he's going to expand on stuff because he really is so eloquent as well that you feel he's been very clear to say when he has made appearances on whatever he's done he, he has been good at, go- at taking steps forward when he's been able to and he has advanced his conversation at times to say, I now have permission to talk about this. He's had a pretty sizable or lengthy gap now between anything he's discussed from then to now. Could he now sit in that you know, setting and lay out, here's what I said last time, here's where we are now, here's what I can say, here's where I'd like to go further forward. So I'd, I would be actually up for Grush, as much as that's a, a repeat witness, I would take Grush again, as long as it was, like you say, kicking the, the story forward. Yeah, Gr- Grush Hour Two. What we'll call it, I guess. Yeah, that 100%. that would be that would be great. Um, and as well, if if it was Grush, again, we have now a very public example of the kind of reprisals that happen against people that come in forward. Yeah. Um, you know, with with that article with the Intercept, where um, I'll just fill it in again. If you're new to this, uh, Grush came out. He was talking and and saying what he did, and then a article was released on the Intercept by a journalist who had gotten his medical records to show that he'd suffered from PTSD and had, you know, just had a hard time, done questionable things. The police had been called during kind of domestic disputes and things like that. Um, Grush was open about this stuff, but the point of it is that those medical records, one, apparently shouldn't have been obtainable by anyone. They shouldn't have been given over. That, That was illegal, apparently, and there's a lawsuit that's happening on that, so we'll get to see the results of that. Um, but two, the journalist, uh, Ken Klippenstein, one, he's since been kicked off Twitter for sharing information he shouldn't have, um, to do with, uh, JD Vance, like his home address and, you know, this dossier that kind of had all of his, it was like a background check on him. Apparently it wasn't that interesting. Um, but it had some sensitive information like his address and stuff. Um, and the journalist, Ken, he was very open. He said he was approached by someone from the intelligence community and tipped off as to where to find these things. So he knew exactly the office to go to, exactly the person to talk to, to actually get those files. So it raises an eyebrow. And again, it's, it's a very real example of a reprisal that happens against someone instead of just, oh, I've had threats in the background. Yeah. And there's a lot of people out there going, ah, prove it. You know, what, what's happened? And and those details aren't able to be shared because, you know, maybe it was just a dude in a dark black coat following down an alley or something that, you know, he didn't get a picture or whatever. But this is something that was public. So it, it would, I, I think that would add some, some weight to what he's saying too. Any swings for the fences of stuff you would like to see, but is almost definitely probably not going to, happen or occur because it's just like it's your dream avengers movie type scenario you know oh every everyone's going to appear this happens this happens what would be the the ideal scenario for you here i i think the 
the realistic swing for the fence would be what I said, you know, just a photo from Immaculate Constellations database. That would be awesome. Could possibly happen. Probably won't. But then the massive swing for the fence that I'd love to see but just won't happen would be for whoever the witness is to say I'm a first-hand witness, reach in their pocket and just drop a piece of material on the desk. You know, maybe a scientific report with it or something like that. Just, you know, here's what I'm talking about. Again, it, it's yeah. something people can hook onto instead of a story. It makes it very, very real very quickly. Yeah, I think my, again, realistic swing for the fence, because obviously you could go, oh, yeah, same scientist comes in, clicks a button, a UFO appears. That's not going to happen. They all do <laughs> CE5 and it appears above them. That's how that works. Um, no, for me, that was very flippant, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> real realistic but big swing for the fence would be a whistleblower coming forward. Similar to what you say, not even necessarily dropping material, but someone similar to the the scientist played by Brent Spiner, who was Data in Star Trek and Independence Day, where you have this person who has worked on this stuff, but properly worked on it. Maybe similar to a Bob Lazar. A Bob Lazar testifying, maybe that's got too much baggage with it, I don't know. But someone who, I suppose, recently is like, I am literally been working on this stuff. I have been working with craft and potentially non-human bodies. This is what I've been doing. I can talk about more detail in the background, but we have been reverse engineering. We have been doing this. And that's a first-hand whistleblower who has recently worked on this stuff. It wasn't in the 80s or 90s, you know, um, and can literally... In, in a closed door session with Congress and others, talk more about it. I still think that's a step too far. And that's why I'm saying it's a big swing for the fence. I don't think we're going to get that just yet. Yeah, that that would be amazing. And it, it would it would almost change the conversation overnight, something like that. But you're also right. It it, it almost is a step too far, isn't it? I, I think it's kind of wearing stuff. the lab coat. They've still got the lab coat on. <laughs> so yeah. Exactly the same. The crazy hair and everything. Yeah. You know. Yeah. The very exciting time. Exciting is a really good use. <laughs> is, is there anything, Dan, before we get to some lineups to discuss um that were sent in? Anything you wouldn't like to see and which you'd like to see stayed away from? Definitely any kind of public displays of questionable things that are unconfirmed, like what happened with the Nazca mummies at the Mexico hearing. You know, that conversation has developed now to a point where it's getting interesting because science is leading that conversation now. And there are hearings coming up for that. And there are hearings coming up, yep. yep. So, you know, real interesting. If you're at all interested in the subject, check them out. But the way that that was presented really damaged that conversation and the way that it could have gone. And it kind of felt like, a, you know, a circus. Um, just wheeling them on stage after that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, it really kind of devalued the whole thing. And all anyone spoke about from that hearing were the mummies. You, you know, that that image broke out. There were people like, is it cake? And they had the, those videos of the mummies' yeah. cake. Um, and, and it sucked because it should have been a proper kind of analysis of them and presentation. And I, I guess that's what we're going to get from Peru probably. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't want to see anything like that. Like that, that's almost, it's almost too much, you, you know? It, it yeah. just felt very unprofessional. It felt very cheap. It felt very like nineties, I guess. Yeah, I think for me, um, maybe a selfish one, but that's the whole point of me answering this. Uh, I don't want to really hear any more at this hearing about gimbal, tic tac, go fast, Nimitz, Princeton, Omaha. I'd I'd like to hear some some new stuff. Um, not just, I get a lot of that would be new for the public, but it was touched on in the last hearing. We've heard about those cases and stories. Um, I'd like to hear new. I'd like to hear recent, if possible. Um, I'd like to hear, you know, so yeah, sorry, what I, what I don't want to hear is that let's not retread over old ground. And that includes stuff that has been on mainstream news quite a lot that the public has heard people talk about and should kind of be in, in the public domain anyway. So Tic Tac, Go Fast Gimbal, all that kind of stuff, just let's, we've had that. Um, unless you're going to bring the gimbal video out and show us the rest of the footage where we see the, the spheres and the cubes in front of the object and all that yeah. kind of stuff. We're not. So let's let's move forward and not retread 
old ground that was covered in the last hearing that has been covered extensively in the mainstream as well. So, yeah, that would be my hope and big ask from, from this hearing as it's it's going forward. And I think you said it, Dan, we've got to see some kind of progress and some kind of foot forward, um, which I suppose then brings us to to names of people who who may or may not. So on the breakdown we, we recorded just recently, we discussed who we would like to see, Dan. Um, I'll mention quickly for folks who maybe never heard that or don't remember, I said personally I'd love to hear um, physicist Eric Davis, who is, I think, most famous for the, the Admiral Wilson memo documents, basically, that Eric Davis had a conversation in the back of a car in a shadowy garage with Admiral Thomas Wilson about Thomas Wilson's journey to find stovepipe UAP retrieval programs. And even in the lofty position he was, he found it, it was so frustrated, wasn't he, finding how difficult it was to get information that he should be privy to and should have access to. Yeah. And doors were slammed in his face. And it had all this incredible discussion around it. And um, people like Joe Murgia and Richard Dolan have done wonderful breakdowns of all that, that information. I've spoken to Joe Murgia at length about the notes as well. So go and check those out. Um I would love to see an Eric Davis because also he seems a kind of guy that has probably and likely worked on a lot of programs or consulted on a lot of programs as well. He seems a kind of guy that a private contractor calls to bring in to say, look, we've got this bit of material and we can get it to do X, Y, and Z, but we're really struggling to get it to, to do A, B, and C. Any ideas? Here's what we've got so far. It helps out for a little while. I could, in my head, that's what an Eric Davis could be. So I would really love to see him. And I think on top of that, Dan, um, would be Hal put off probably. Because in so much of the UFO topic and conversation, when we talk about that umbrella or spider diagram, I think it's not even six degrees of separation from any person or topic to get to Hal put off. It's probably one or two because he's so involved across so much of the UFO conversation and lore going back decades as well. So he must be up there for me in a top three or five people of knowledge of what's going on. He'd be someone you would want to speak to. So if it's going to be Tim Gallaudet, we know, and I had to see another couple, I'm going Eric Davis and and Hal Putov, if it wasn't A.N. Other that we don't know. Yeah, I, I agree. They, they'd be two excellent choices. Um both Davis and Putoff have kind of alluded to be in first hand, uh, to having first hand experience with these programs as well. So I, I think, you know, a, a lot of the buck stop with them. Uh, I've often said that Lakatsky should testify because he's another one, you know, one or two degrees from people, uh, seems to have uh, some deep experience with, with these technologies. He's spoken on podcasts and then stopped himself about. A craft that we were able to open and things like that like there's knowledge there that he's not sharing um sadly he has said that he will not testify uh but i'd still love to see him there um i i'd love colonel carl nell to testify he's been around now for you know maybe maybe a year or so he, he spoke at the Sol conference uh given his kind of rollout plan for a control disclosure versus catastrophic and going really deeply into it he, he's clearly a, a very deep thinker on this topic um very accomplished guy um has done so much work um and one of his jobs was integrating a lot of systems across the u.s security apparatus so that to me sounds like something like golden domes could be that mm. you know you're linking all these different satellites and sensors and stuff together so that no matter where something comes into the atmosphere or it's detected it alert the right people at the right time um that that's the kind of thing that he he had a hand in Probably. Good shout. Nell, um, yeah, really good shout with yeah. Nell. So I'd love to see him there. He he has as well said that he has first-hand knowledge that uh, NHI, non-human intelligence, is real and here. Uh, so again, you know, the big statements, like, like let's get him on, on record doing that. Uh, one person uh, that I'd really love, which is, it's kind of a deep kind of pick, and, and you'd almost have to waste a lot of time introducing him, would be Neil McCasland. Mm -hmm. Neil McCasland was one of Tom DeLonge's advisors for To The Stars. He is one of the people, kind of prime suspect in directing Tom in what he was doing, what he'd talk about, uh, confirming little nuggets that Tom would send him and things like that. Um, and I say Tom, just all the people at To The Stars. So, but he hasn't really been present. He doesn't talk about this publicly. He hasn't put himself out there. Uh, he's just 
in the shadows in the background. So I, I'd love to see him uh, coming forward and, and starting to talk about this stuff. Probably similar to a, an Admiral Thomas Wilson in terms of he doesn't talk about it publicly. He yep. denies it. McCausland, as you say, he's one of the suggestions from listeners as well. Um, seems to be somebody Tom DeLong was very much in with and, like you say, gave him a lot of his information. Admiral Thomas Wilson seems to have done that for Eric Davis, but denied it and and as he has so so yeah, yeah dan shall we get to some of the listeners suggestions before we get let's to go for it questions um so let's go to it so we'll kick off uh with joss joss sent the initial question in last week dan just wondering what your ideal lineup would be for the congressional hearings so you had to say three uh, three to choose from personally i'd like to hear from chris mellon lou elizondo and carl nell i think having them reiterate what they've been saying under oath would hold a lot of weight even if it's old news to the uap community you've touched on nell dan already um, have we mentioned Lou Elizondo in this one yet? I don't think we have. Uh, we did in the break. So what about um, Elizondo and Mellon, Dan? Where would those sit for you in terms of this particular hearing? M Mellon is always really considered in his approach, but I don't know how much first-hand experience he has with this yeah. kind of stuff, which would be the sticking point for me. I'm with um, you on that. Same. He, he speaks in a way that Congress understands, you know, when you look at his blogs, we've always said, like, they're not for us. He's talking to people in Congress. Like, this is the language he's using. Um, he's very calm and considered, but I'm not sure exactly how much he could bring to the table. It, on it that, be, I've heard stories, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. I think Chris Mellon does his best work backstage. You know, yeah, sure. definitely he's, he's helping move things about. He's helping orchestrate. I think he's providing... Um, I was going to say constellation. Christ, I've never got that word stuck in my head. <laughs> um, he's consulting. You know, he's 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 getting folks together and speaking to people and saying this is what we could be doing. This is what is happening. So yeah, Chris Mellon for me definitely a a backstage guy in the best possible way. So I'm with you on yeah, that. Yeah, hundred percent. Like he he's when you talk about like the best film producers, you never see them on screen or like the best directors. They're not on screen. They're the ones pulling the strings and kind of. M Night Shyamalan. I that's exactly who I was thinking of when I said that. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, I, I love his movies, but I, I see the exception of the rule. <laughs> I guess so, yeah. He yeah. has very small parts, doesn't he? Um uh, yeah. That could come across the wrong way. I mean, in his movies. Um no offense <laughs> M Night if he's listening. What what was uh, we were talking about Golden Domes earlier? Yes, that's the one. Um the signs were there. Wait. Hey. No, um, so yeah, <laughs> and also Lou. Lou, I I could see being a interesting choice to testify at these hearings just because he's been on a roll his books out he's a recognizable face for the public at this point um probably not for all of them you, you know i'm jaded i'm in this every day uh but i i can see why uh they would ask him to testify and seeing him take an oath would certainly kind of underline things when you spoke to him you asked him about you know what's the end game for you are you in this forever or is there a finish line for you and he said that one day he kind of wanted to hang up you know his his hat so to speak and go off onto the horizon and let let other people enter the sunset sorry and let other people kind of take over this i think that would almost be a, an amazing cap on that journey to kind of go from you know making waves in the ufo community to getting a book out there getting on things like the daily show really kind of spreading the word on this and then putting his hand up taking the oath and saying everything in in a public setting officially uh to people that wouldn't pick up his book and things like that I I would say I wouldn't want to hear Lou at this one because similar to what you have just said, all that that his books just came out, how much more could they add? I'm not particularly fussed myself, like I've mentioned on the oath side of things. So I'd be sure. wanting to hear from, from some new folks that could provide us information that hasn't just been released and is widely available. Um, I don't know yeah, how much it. more he would go into or could go into publicly. Um, so yeah, for me, no. Uh, Nell definitely of those three would be the one I think on a stand. I feel like we're picking football teams, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, like fantasy, fantasy <laughs> team. Um, David said, What about Travis Taylor for the hearings, Dan, former UAP task force chief scientist and star of Skinwalker Ranch? 
in the kindest way possible, no. Um, right, why? <laughs> Let me I just don't preface. Feel... He, I've got an idea of what you're thinking and what you might say, politely. He has an unbelievable CV and academically is incredibly well qualified, like ridiculously Absolutely. qualified to do anything. Um, however, is there, and let me ask before you say anything. You, you an might element, get my exact reasoning. <laughs> okay. Um, is there an element of, it's also the guy from Ancient Aliens live tour testifying yeah, and, and Skinwalker Ranch, I think, you know, the, those shows don't land with everybody and they kind of come off, you know, they can come off cheesy. There's a format to them. Um, and there's maybe, I don't know, like 10 minutes of content per one hour episode. And there's a persona and baggage that kind of comes with someone like Travis. So as qualified as he is in the lineup of possibles between like Eric Davis and Carl Nell and people like that, I, I would pick no. Too much of a TV star. Yeah, I also he he's very uh, enthusiastic about letting rockets off, and this is a closed door setting, so it wouldn't be a good idea to let rockets yeah. off in there. Maybe if those public hearings happen outdoors. Um, uh, so Numa, uh, first time I've seen Numa comment or anything. So hello, thank you, um, Admiral Wilson and Eric Davis, and um, because of the Wilson notes, I think we've discussed those both. The other one, Dan, mm -hmm. Bobby Ray Inman because of the oh, Bob Oshler interviews. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, the, these guys go way back with this subject. And I know from talking, I mean, Jay, Jay at Project Unity spoke to uh, Inman, right? And, yeah, yeah, he did, yeah. And like that, that was really intriguing because I spoke to Jay around that and what Jay expected to happen in that interview wasn't what happened. He was told something else off the record and then the guy didn't come out swinging. So putting that guy under oath and having him talk a bit more in, in a setting where he feels comfortable um, and is held to account, I, I think that could produce something interesting. And and Bobby Ray Inman, just double checking here, um, I've just got my assistant, Chat GPT, to remind me that he's a retired US Navy Admiral and former, former intelligence officer. Um, so he is someone who he served as director of the National uh, Security Agency, so the NSA, and deputy director of the CIA during his career, which you would expect someone with that level of influence, power, information would know some stuff, would know yeah. some shizzle, as the kids say. <laughs> the, the CIA come up again and again and again in this. And if for anyone that watched Beyond on MGM this week, one of the first things that said in the program is that the CIA approached Gary Nolan to do a bunch of studies on people that some of them turned out to be victims of Havana syndrome and other ones had encounters with UAP. Um, so the CIA, they do they just go way back. They're clearly looking into this. They're not talking about stuff. And as we all know, the CIA do stuff kind of under the table and, and don't talk about what they're doing. Some of it is less than stellar kind of you know, on, on moral grounds. So I, I would love... For the cia to kind of be held to account for this and, and i think at some point they're going to come into the conversation here's an interesting shout i'd be intrigued to hear your opinions on dan mc buchanan says sean kirkpatrick his participation could bring an officially sanctioned view which would create a compelling contrast with the perspectives of whistleblowers whether he represents a government stance acts as a disinformation agent or is simply unaware of broader dynamics his involvement could provide valuable insight into the narrative surrounding the issue by juxtaposing his stance with those challenging it the, dis the discussion could yield a deeper understanding of the underlying forces and motivations at play so Dr. K, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, Dan? Um, he already testified, right? Uh, he, he testified to, I want to say, the... This all gets mucked up in my head. Was it, was it the Gillibrand? Services? Was it the yeah, Gillibrand, Gillibrand and that. Yeah. And he, he kind of gave an appearance, you know, under oath, talking about this stuff. So I, I feel like he's kind of shared his position on it. He's no longer in that program. Um, and, and I don't think he's going to talk out of step. You, you know, he, he's got a, a cushy job that he kind of fell into after that. He clearly, he, he said he was approached to do the job as opposed to sort it out. 
Mm -hmm. And I, I think he got a bit of a back rub off of that. So I, I don't think he'd be looking to rock the boat. I think it would just be similar to what we heard him say before. Um, and, you know, he, he's the guy that gets asked, have we got any evidence of NHI visits on Earth? And he'll say, no, there's no evidence of aliens visits on Earth. And it's like, ah, that's not what we asked you. Yeah. <laughs> so I feel like we just have board games like that. Uh, Joey is not my name, famous on the old Discord, uh, says, I want to see new faces who have direct involvement in the black programs, like Michael Herrera. No, he didn't actually say Michael Herrera, that's just for Joey. <laughs> uh, but he said Thanks. he wants to see new faces who have direct involvement in black programs. I think we, we both said we would like yeah. to see that. Yeah, so we'll, we've touched on that one. Joey, uh, Gnosis says, as above, um, that was actually a comment he'd made previously. The top pick <laughs> would be Neil McCasland, as you mentioned, Dan. Um, yes. Based on believing Tom DeLong's interactions with him being genuine, and his three would be McCasland, James Lakatsky, and Carl Nell. Um, oh, I can um, get behind that lineup. That's a yeah. that's an all star lineup right there. It's, it's it's not bad, is it? That's pretty decent. Yeah. Um, Tim said Admiral Tom Wilson, fair enough. Um, Saucy Puppets, love the name, uh, said <laughs> obviously Galadet and likely Lou, uh, maybe the Immaculate Constellation person and Eric Davis as a long shot. Um, and there was a load more, but it starts to get variations on a theme. And I've not had the chance to go through all the Twitter ones, but we'll we'll get to that um, in other time. Um, listener questions, Dan, to finish off, get through some of these. Let's go. Uh, I thought this would be like a half hour one or something, but here we are. Um, so Christian from Kill the Stigma podcast. Hello to Christian. I said I would stop promoting that actually, didn't I? So Christian from his podcast. Um, <laughs> Kill the Stigma. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, due to whistleblowers being terrified and the skills that the secret keepers have, how many whistleblower how many whistleblowers do Dan and Andy expect to see? I'm interested in Lou Elizondo and Tim Gallaudet, but I really want to hear about Immaculate Constellation. Michael Schellenberger said that guy. the guy is terrified. Rubio said something similar about other whistleblowers. The best way to be safe is come out in public. Now, everyone wants whistleblowers to come out, but it's got a difficult. It's going to be difficult because especially if you have dirt. I have dirt. I'm 35 years old. My life before 27 was a disaster. Nothing too bad or weird, but everyone has secrets and they will probably be exposed. Then you've got UFO Twitter, which honestly I wouldn't care about. I just wouldn't have a Twitter account. Anyways, enough. Break it down as you like, Andy. I've just read it out as you've written it, Christian. Nice. Um, which, yeah, I think that's the thing where it's difficult for whistleblowers. We touched on that, didn't we, Dan? Um, yeah. How many whistleblowers do we expect to see? realistically I, i'd be shocked if we got more than one name that we didn't already know yeah same there, there's going to be a basis of something we already know but it, it does make me think you know if there's another hearing after this who who sits in the seats then because we're, we're kind of almost running out of the heavy hitters then um and, and we need to start tapping you, you know the i guess immaculate conception we could probably hazard a guess that it's less than 10 people that have come forward, you know, single figures that are talking about that. Uh, Grush has mentioned... That. That's, that's not correct. <laughs> Grush has said... Um, no, no, it's not. You, you're factually incorrect. You called the program Immaculate Conception. So oh, as God. Aware, no program <laughs> Immaculate Conception. So you're... Kirk spilt... Patrick's running circles around me. <laughs> yeah, spilt and bullshit. Yep, well Whoops. done. Um, <laughs> then Grush had 40-plus... Uh, 40, 40 witnesses that he he said um that he'd spoken to so there there supposedly a lot of people out there that are talking about this stuff who haven't come forward yet so it would be great to start seeing them uh yeah but i guess not at this hearing you know we're not going to get 40 plus they would all have like one minute each to to speak about anything yeah um, Phil Massa, we've kind of answered this, but will the congressional hearings expose more details of Immaculate Constellation? We're all wondering, but of course we can only speculate. Is there anyone who is actually optimistic? The hearings will change any of our current understanding. So we've talked about the first part, but Dan, on that second aspect, will the hearings change any of our current understandings? I'm hopeful that they can push things forward a bit. If, if we come out of this with another hearing where Again, we have another Jurassic Park moment, some knocks at the door um, that Grush provided. I think that would be really positive because then you can start adding up a body of evidence that, you know, there's this guy said this last year. This person said this this year. We've had others, rear admirals backing stuff up, pilots backing stuff up, scientists backing stuff up. It starts to become more of a thing. Um, 
So I think definitely can. That of course it can go the other way and completely disappoint. Um, and we'll do a very quick elevator pitch at the end, Dan, as to what we think will happen. Um, just to summarise, but um, I think they can change public perception slightly, just slightly, but not. They're not going to impact the entire public with one hearing. No, I I agree, and we we've got to recognise as well that there was a a great phrase that Lou recently said on a podcast where he said, you know, you don't you don't shove a twelve course meal down someone's throat all at once because you'll kill them. Um, you got to go slowly. So I, I feel like this will be similar. You know, we might get a little bit more for as long as it gives Congress the the need to have another hearing to follow these leads. I, I feel like that's a good step forward. Uh, Human Neutrino, uh, similar vein, uh, says, if the November hearing goes ahead, what's to stop it slipping into history? Like the last one, Grush disclosed a lot of US DOD dirty laundry, and now only the diehard UFO follower is aware. I don't think that's an unfair point. Um, what do you think needs to come out for this to break the mainstream media embargo and put this front and centre where it should be? I don't think we can get that from this hearing. Um, but I I suppose what my disappointment from last year's is, Dan, we expected, and I think I said at the time, the, the real impact would be what comes next from that hearing. And we mm -hmm. didn't get the Grush op-ed or a, another follow-up from Grush that I thought we maybe expected, which I'm kind of surprised at. Um, I would like to think David Grush kind of breaks his silence after this hearing even if it's just to kind of come out and back up what people are saying, I don't know. Um, I I don't think there will be a break of the mainstream media embargo. I'm at the point, I've said, Dan, recently haven't had it, I don't think one person or one single thing will break this open for people. It's going to have to be a constant hammering away at the door. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that as well. You, you need just thing after thing after thing. It needs to snowball. Um, otherwise, it's just going to fade and it's not necessarily because it's uninteresting or people aren't interested or they don't want to know or they're not driven, but just the media and how it is now, like stuff will come and go so quickly from that cycle. And when this hearing happens, we're, we're in what's called like a lame duck session, like Congress isn't in session. The election would have happened. It'll be the fallout of that. Yeah. Are you really going to have a louder voice than that with anything? I, I don't think so. And unless, you know, something drastic happens, like someone drops some cereal on a table and there'll be a picture of that on the front of the BBC or something like that. But even then, it would only be there for like five hours, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like I say, Grush last year, four days, I think it stayed in the news cycle in the UK. Um, and then yeah. the interest was was gone. Um, yeah. But it was a pretty big weight that landed over here, which was, was nice to see. Um, Russell... In respect of the hearing on 13th November, is there a way to prearrange to have the option of a SCIF, a sensitive compartmented information facility, for any of the witnesses called? I feel this would give added assurances to potential witnesses. I'm not too sure, Dan, on the ins and outs of that, that if they say something, like last year, Grush said a few times, I'm happy to give that information in a SCIF, you know, basically a room sectioned off for an area that is no mobile phones, very secure, you know, data sensitive. Um, I don't know if they have one on site that they would go straight into a room or if it's a case that days later or weeks later they would meet separately. I don't know how that would work. There, there would be skiffs in the capsule building and stuff like that. You know, there, there are just directives for how a room has to be laid out, electronically protected, so on and so yeah. forth. Those kind of things would be there because that's part of their work. So I I would imagine they're absolutely there. But, on but for this well. specifically that but, you would go yeah. straight into that? For this, I don't know. Um, there are other things where, like other hearings where they've gone into a classified session afterwards. Immediately uh, after, yeah. But whether that was on site, don't know. I know with Grush, the issue was that he didn't have his clearance, so he's not allowed to go into the skiff. You know, he has to be given clearance to be able to get into that. Technicalities can yeah, stop technicalities, you from red happening. tape, yeah. that kind of stuff. So cool. yeah, that, to totally agree. They they should be able to go into it afterwards. Whether they do or not, all depends on the people who testify as clearances. And we'll wrap up with one more question from Algo. Quite a big one because there's some uh, predictions and stuff in here as well. So once you have time to discuss, I'd like to hear uh, your. I'd like to hear you take the other side of the argument. What if disclosure is catastrophic in any case? 
Most of the people advocating for disclosure are assuming that humanity will cope with it and just move on with their lives. I doubt that. I'll try to make some predictions. He gives four, Dan. One, people in power are going to spin their narrative. The NHI are our enemies. They will subdue us. Now give up your freedoms and your possessions so we can protect you. Number two, NHI, the new frontier. Billionaires are going to try to get access to NHI at all costs. Who's going to be the first to take a selfie with an NHI? Three, other billionaires are going to spend insane amounts of money to ask NHI about their advanced tech to prolong their lifespan. Four, a lot of self-proclaimed priests and mediums are going to teach the paying public how to communicate with NHI. Surely there are more situations to consider, but just these examples go to show her that the genie is not going back into the bottle. There will be many of us that will exhibit completely unpredictable behaviour. This rebalancing of our reality might take more than a generation. Fair point. So I guess my question to you is, how sure are you the benefits of disclosure outweigh the risks? Please note that these reactions would be independent of what the NHI would actually do. It would probably do nothing. The reaction purely reflects our human condition. So Dan, how sure are we the benefits of disclosure outweigh the risks? Do you want to take that one first or... Yeah, sure. Um, we're not. <laughs> you know, we're just yeah. not. Um, we we can think about this all live long day and come up with policies and how to roll this out, but you just don't know until you roll it out, like this person is saying. Um, cat catastrophic disclosure, when Carl Nell presented it, has a real specific meaning, which is catastrophic to the US government. Um, but I know exactly what the person's getting at here, that it's catastrophic to, to our ways of life, to, to our ways of living. Um, and if this kind of area tickles anyone's fancy, I said it in the breakdown the other day, pick up the book Contact uh, that the movie is based on. There are so many chapters in there that just talk about how humanity changes once we know we're not alone. And this kind of stuff does happen. You know, the billionaire kind of builds his own uh, machine as, as like a backup and is trying to, once that knowledge is there, he's trying to extend his life and so on and so forth. Whereas religions kind of take turns and new ones spring up and things like that. Governments swear allegiances to different ways of living to what we're used to. Um, you know, the, the curtain comes down on a lot of things. The At the moment, we all look to government for answers. But if something appears that, you know, many people see as God, the authority changes. The people you're willing to listen to and respect changes. That yeah. has a huge amount of impact on the people's day to day live in. But then there are those of us that would still go to work nine to five and, you know, cause we've just got stuff to do. So it, it would be a real interesting time and or almost 10 years after it happened, the, there would be some incredible books to looking at the psychology of, of humanity as they went through that moment. Yeah. Same answer. You can't be sure the benefits of disclosure outweigh the risks. We could be sitting immediately after days, weeks, months, and thinking, do you know what, maybe it was better when we just talked about the idea of it rather than the reality. There's a lot of stuff to discuss with it, and I think that's really, really interesting points you make. Um, I would point people in the direction of a book by Richard Dolan and Bryce Sable, AD, <laughs> which discusses many, many of those types of scenarios. But yeah. Um, I, I love that you finally got an actual plug of that where it was relevant. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Um, but it's an interesting question. And what we'll do, Dan, just to wrap up um, elevator pitch, we are jumping in a lift, as we call them in the UK. We're going from floor ground to floor one. Um, and I ask you, Dan, hearings 13th of November in the US, what are we going to get by the end of it? I think we're going to hear Tim Gallaudet kind of give us another point of view on the gimbal encounter um, and pointing out some smoke in the sense that there's fire, that there's a real program that people know about this stuff and they're not talking about it. I think we'll probably get some people putting a name to that program for the people to know about it and probably not much else, to be honest. You know, my, my hopes aren't that high, but I'm also not disappointed if that happens. I, I think that's kind of all that's needed at this juncture. Cool. I'm going to go that we get, I'm going to be hopeful and say something similar to last year with Grush and the the main talking point will be around, or talking points will be around Immaculate Constellation. The fact this was a real program, there'll be more details about the program, uh, sparing details that from a public point of view in terms of what we can actually know and find out. You know, they're not going to go into, I think, dates and we went to 
we went out to this part of a desert in New Mexico and we found this craft and it had this and this and this. But I think you'll hear gene generic terms spoken about. Um, and I'd love to hear maybe it, it touched on that it was the tip of an iceberg for a larger program. It's a subset of a larger program or there were other programs underneath this which spawned off of it. Um, something that Congress, if they really want to pick up the lead and follow up with, can do that. On that, I would like to hear them maybe even begin with something about last year's hearings and given all the things Grush told them, what has happened off the back of that? Yes. Just to give us a little bit of an update to say, here's what we did do. Maybe even to hint they did go to some of these facilities. They might even imagine they dropped in, Dan, to say, we have actually taken some materials that we now have in our possession. But blah, even something like that would be, I think, a bit, oh, wow, bit of a mic drop. I don't yeah. expect it, but that would be good. And I think that would set these hearings off with the idea that regardless of what we're going to hear, there will be impact off the back of it. Something will be followed up on and those tangibles will be, there'll be leads that we, we get something from. And it's not just stories because I I appreciate, and Dan, you've said it enough, I think, in the last few recordings that there there is an element with some of this that people get frustrated with the amount of hearsay and stories. And there's an element of the UFO topic I think we all love when we're hearing testimony or people's stories, you know, or, or they've written a book about their experience. But in this setting, this is where you're really looking for tangible, physical stuff. And it's an opportunity for that. So I hope it's not an opportunity missed. Yeah, a actionable stuff is, is the name of the game here. I, I think we had very different elevator journeys there. Mine was like two floors and you might have got left, up. The uh, left broke, <laughs> left broke down. I'm, I'm talking, you sorry, you uh, hit the red button and talked the person. Yeah, like, yeah. that's how I just got off at the right floor. Um, <laughs> But yeah, that's pretty much it. So what we'll do, folks, if anything bigger happens in the meantime, there'll be some form of update in between. Uh, Dan has his life partner, uh, fiance, visiting the UK. So um, Dan will probably be having a break from a few weeks if people don't hear from him very much on, on socials and whatnot. Dan, is that fair to say? You'll be about, but maybe in the shadows. Yeah, I'll post some pictures like we're going up to Stonehenge and stuff like that. So I'm sure I'll share some pictures and, and Elena and I are both into this subject. So we'll be watching the hearings um, at the tail end of a visit. And yeah, you'll, you'll hear from me after that, I guess. Cool. And if anyone wants to get involved in listener call-ins after the hearings, um, if you can drop me an email, UFO, UAP, AM at gmail.com, I can tell you how those work. It's not live. It's very chilled out. I'll send you a link. We'll arrange a time and date that suits kind of you and just a, just a chat. And if you even decide you don't want me to use it, I never will. But that's not really happened yet. So um, I'd like to do a listener call in right after the hearings, folks. So drop me a message now by email, please, about that. And I'll save those. And Dan, thank you very much for your time. Cheers for joining us. Thank you for having me. That is all for this episode. Thank you very much for tuning in. Don't forget to leave the podcast a review on your chosen platform. Apple and Spotify do make a huge difference to the algorithm. If you're checking the show out on YouTube, please don't forget to like and leave a comment on here as well. Any sharing you do is very much appreciated on any social media platform. And finally, you can listen to shows ad-free and sponsor-free in their glorious full versions by subscribing for less than the price of a coffee on Apple, Spotify, just search That UFO Podcast Premium. YouTube, you can sign up and be a member or you can do that through patreon.com. Thank you very much for listening, folks. It wasn't a tic-tac and not quite a saucer, more like a hubcap designed by Chaucer, a little baroque and quite steampunk, like Alice was playing bass for the Parliament of Folk. The little fucker hovered right outside of my window and when I shoved out the screen, he made it an issue. I don't think he expected me to see his ass, but I'd had some champagne and smoked a little. Thank you.